first letter to the Corinthians. It be the God and Father of our Lord. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight. Timothy chapter 6. title is Proving the Lord and it will be a refresher in personal prayer and hopefully we shall follow a devotional study of this glorious verse and it will be very straightforward picking the elements out of the verse to refresh our minds and concerning all the principles of personal prayer and I begin with the obvious in the sixth verse, be careful for nothing, which uh, means let there be no anxiety, no sense of being abandoned by God in Christians, no uh, apprehension over anything, any situation other than things which should rightly give rise to concern, obviously. It's right for people to be very concerned about uh, getting duties done, fulfilling obligations, keeping promises, doing all the things that are rightly expected of us by others. Above all, it's a matter of great concern with us, uh, not anxiety exactly, but concern that we keep up our spiritual duties and obligations. We should have very great concern about sin, about regular self-examination, about prayer to God, about mortifying the deeds of the body and putting to death sin. Of course, all those things concern us. The Apostle Paul, quite obviously, does not have that in mind when he says, be careful for nothing. If we were indifferent to those obligations and those crucial duties in life, then we wouldn't carry them out. We need a certain amount of anxiety and concern to be conscientious as Christians and loyal to the Lord. Of course we do. So it would be crazy to interpret the words of the apostle as though he was including everything. But he means affairs of this world should never consume us over much and create great anxiety and disturbance within us so that uh, these things are constant and uncontrolled in our heads. Be careful for nothing. No situation or trial outside the kind of things I've mentioned should ever overwhelm us. Verse 5, should always remain alive. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Now, if a trial comes, and it's one that we've got ourselves into, that it's brought about by our own foolishness or our sin, well then, the best thing we can do, obviously, is to repent. And that will minister to us, and even the consequences will minister to us. But we're talking about ordinary, worldly affairs and difficulties. These should never overwhelm us. Be careful. The word translated careful has to do with being divided, being distracted by something, so that your thoughts are no longer one united train of thought, but you're always concerned about this and concerned about that. You're distracted from the things which should chiefly occupy your mind. It's a different word, by the way, in the Greek than the word translated in verse 10 as careful. Down there in verse 10, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful. Well, those cares are a different word, which in this context means thoughtful, thinking, thoughtful. But uh, back in verse 6, it is distracted thoughts and anxiety, and these should never run us and rule us. So that's the first point in the verse. Be careful for nothing. There's nothing. By the way, undue 
concern about earthly things and being easily disturbed and thrown and worrying about them or anxious and upset about things that go on in ordinary life, this is habit forming. It will get uh, worse. If you're a great warrior, somebody who the slightest offense or problem completely throws you and you lapse into worry and self-pity, you will get worse if you don't do something about it. And as the months, as the years go by, these things will become more frequent, your bouts of disturbance will grow longer, deeper in severity. It's definitely habit forming and it gives rise to self-pity, gives rise to anger against the sea, uh, well, apparent perpetrators of your difficulty. It leads to a neglect of spiritual things, a failure of your trust in God, leads to hypocrisy, because you've got to pretend that you're doing well as a Christian believer, and you're not. You're falling at every fence, and it ruins your testimony, and particularly to your children. You've got young children. They see you're a person whose life is a contradiction, that everything throws you. You're an emotional weakling. Everything throws you and causes you to react badly. And yet you say that you have a hold on God and it doesn't make sense to them. And so it's, it ruins your testimony in the home. It ruins your testimony among your work colleagues or student colleagues. They can see you're a person who isn't steady and strong, has no resources from God, cannot cope with trials and problems. So it's actually quite devastating. Don't let it go. And everybody has bouts of this when you go to pieces at things and at your lot. But the Apostle Paul says, be careful, anxious, distracted, other than on the issues we've mentioned, for nothing, not in anything. But then we go to the second uh, thought here in verse 6, our second heading in a sense, but in everything by prayer and supplication. And I just like those words, in everything, apart from the kind of things we've mentioned as far as earthly, human relationship concerns and all that, well, there is nothing. Under all circumstances, in every situation, we may pray, we may come to the Lord. I'm very frequently talking about William Upton's dog. I mention it a lot to a lot of people and you've probably heard me mention William Upton's dog before. For our visitors from Father Afield, William Upton was a pastor who ministered a few hundred yards away from the tabernacle and he was a great friend of C.H. Spurgeon, much younger but a very great friend and often they were together. And William Upton thought he was going to pieces because he couldn't sleep at night. He was kept up by a neighbor's dog. Not a neighbor to the side, but a neighbor whose garden backed onto his. Those were the days when there were gardens around here in central London. Anyway, uh, the dog would bark at night and nobody else seemed to be bothered, but he couldn't sleep. And he said, to Spurgeon said to him one day, you're, you're not yourself, what's the matter? He said, it's my neighbor's dog. And he told the sad story and Spurgeon said to him, well, have you prayed about this? He said, I can't pray about a dog. I can't go to the God of heaven about a dog. Why not? I would. And so he did. And he prayed that somehow God would help him overcome this problem with the dog. And after a while, things got much better for him. And he realized that the dog hadn't been barking for some nights and he'd slept very soundly and so on. And when visiting someone in the street that backed on to his, uh, he said, you know what's happened to Mr. So-and-so? And they said, oh, he moved. He found a cheaper house to rent. In the days when all the houses were rented, unless you were a gentleman, a rich person. And uh, he said he moved away. And this was within days of his praying. There isn't anything you cannot bring before the Lord. 
in all trials and tribulations, large things, small things, and that's what the apostle is telling us, and it's the inspired word of God, in everything by prayer and supplication. In everything, dear friends, every event, every trial, every opportunity that you have to do anything for the Lord, however small, bring it before the Lord, every illness, every temptation, everything is brought before the Lord. Whether things to be done or things to be endured, we pray, whether large or whether small, the mighty heart of God is open to his people in every conceivable situation, either to deliver us or to equip us to stand up to the problem and the trial or to call us to endure it, which is part of our training, and if nothing else, our development of sympathy for others passing through similar trials. So be careful, anxious over nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Let's just think of some hindrances to prayer. What stops us praying? Well, the devil. The devil is active to keep you from prayer. You may be a very good creature of habit. You may have so ordered your life, and this is tremendous, that you come to prayer, personal, private prayer, at the same time, regularly, and you will not let it go. That's good. Maybe there's another dimension of prayer, however, you don't pursue, and that is prayer throughout the day calling upon the Lord briefly in many needs and in many circumstances. Well, Satan will do everything to stop the people of God praying. It's uh, what various hindrances we meet in coming to the mercy seat, wrote the poet William Cowper. It's true. What various hindrances we meet. All kinds of things occur to us. Tiredness suddenly comes over us. All sorts of things intervene. If you're a child of God and you've trusted in the shed blood of Christ and you've yielded your life to him and you've found him, you know this very well. You identify with this. Isn't it astonishing how many distractions suddenly appear to keep you from prayer? Well, recognize that you're being held back you're being prevented. Fight against it. Come and pray. And then there's the problem of discipline. How often it's a, it's a matter of discipline. We haven't developed a regular pattern for prayer. Sometimes, and this is an obvious thing to say, but sometimes it's because we haven't learned to say no. And friends, perhaps, especially if we're young, friends call. Especially these days, there's a call, there's a message, there's something to respond to. It's not really the right time. It's the only time you've got left to pray. But you can't say no. You've got to pick it up. You've got to respond. You've got to go with that person. You've got to spend that time. That will wreck your prayer if you've never learned to say no. Probably no, there's a... English writer has a whole piece about this from the past. Have courage, my boy, to say no. Sounds childish, but it's true. You've got to learn to say no, because the Lord comes first. That's your time. That's what you'd set. Now I can't go and play this and play that tonight, because I will get back much too late, and there'll be no prayer. You've got to be firm with yourself, and have discipline, and stick to your program and your undertakings. Whether, whether you pray will stand or fall often on that point alone. So don't let poor discipline or smallness of faith. I don't believe. You'd never say it. You'd never express this. But really you are saying it. I don't believe that prayer would do any good in this particular situation. You don't understand. It's not the sort of thing that could be helped by prayer. And that thought comes to us. And that's a lack of faith. Maybe you haven't been proving the Lord in prayer for a long time. 
Maybe you haven't been praying much, so you haven't had those gracious answers to prayer that build up your faith. So when something really difficult happens, you don't have the faith even to pray. And that's a particular tragedy. Or maybe you can't pray easily because you've got unrepented of sin. You know you've done this and that and you're still doing it and you shouldn't be. You're a believer. It's against the standards of the Lord for his people and you haven't repented of it or there's something you've said and you've turned somebody's life upside down and you haven't apologized, you haven't repented of it and God isn't going to listen to you. So prayer is difficult and you seem to have lost the heart and the stomach for it. There are all sorts of hindrances to prayer because it's the Lord of heaven and earth that we're dealing with and it's not easy to pray or secure answers to prayer if there's hypocrisy or double dealing in life or we're inconsistent and insincere. You may have failed to get answers to prayer because you've asked amiss as the Apostle James James says in James 4 and verse 2, and you've asked for things for your own benefit only, to please yourself, material things, and you haven't received them, and so you've kind of lost your faith and your trust in prayer. Well, let's look on down at this text and come to this detail. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. What's the difference? between prayer and supplication. The inspired apostle never speaks as we do. We heap up synonyms sometimes when we speak. And uh, they say particularly preachers do this. And the apostle was a preacher, but he doesn't do this in scripture. When he uses two words where you think one will do, there's usually a vital difference between them. And it's worth studying because it's, it's valuable. It contributes much. Prayer. Well, the word prayer is to, broadly, as you know, to call upon God. But the derivation of the word in the original is to look to God or to lean upon God. Best look to God. So the word prayer has to do more with the act of reaching him or reaching out to him. Whereas the word supplication has to do with what you actually plead and how you plead for it. There's a difference between the words. When both are used, when the prayer word is used by itself, it covers everything. When it's used with another word, it runs into its more distinctive track and meaning. So prayer and supplication tells us this. You've got to reach the Lord before you actually ask him anything. There, it, it's very helpful to us to have this highlighted, that there are at least these two aspects to prayer. You've got to look to him, reach out to him, and lean on him before we consider the way in which you ask. Well, what does that mean? Well, obviously it means that we have to extol, you wouldn't do this for an emergency prayer. You might only have five seconds to pray in some emergency during the day. But in your devotional, personal, private prayer, you have got to reach out to God. You've got to knock on a door, open it, mount the step, cross the threshold, as you would entering a house. And in prayer, the way to do that is to recognize who he is to extol his worth, to worship him, even if it's only in a set number of words, to think of his attributes and his greatness and to affirm them. Oh, you know what I mean. You're experienced with this, but it should start all our prayers to acknowledge that he is Lord of heaven and earth. We read Hezekiah's prayer way back in the Old Testament 700 BC and the start of the prayer is exactly like that. It is an adoration of God and a recognition of him. He's putting himself 
but you can't put yourself, it's only Christ that does this, but he is, as it were, putting himself, entering into the throne room of God on high. And when you pray, you do that. You acknowledge who you're praying to. You acknowledge his greatness. You acknowledge his holiness. And even as you do those things, you know you're going to have to come cleanly and repent of your sin. You know that you're going to have to come sincerely and respectfully, reverently and carefully. You can't acknowledge his greatness and his holiness without thinking of those things. By prayer, acknowledging God, the Holy One, the one to whom you must one day give account, the one to whom you owe everything, your life, your salvation, your eternity, the one who knows you through and through, the one who is all-powerful. Just think of him and extol his worth. Pause, reflect, purify your heart, watch your words, honour him and glorify him. And that also has the effect of building up your own faith. That isn't your motive. You're reaching out to him. But it does that. But if you approach your God as though he's a nobody, as though he's a next-door neighbor, well, you'll never reach him. So when prayer is used, coupled together with supplication, it takes on the meaning of reach out, call upon your God. So prayer is locating God and contacting him. And supplication is asking. The requests, the pleadings, the word supplication comes ultimately from a compound word in the Greek which means to beg and to bind. It's a very interesting derivation. You ask, and as you ask, you pledge yourself. You come like one who's begging for something and giving yourself. That's the spirit of prayer. It isn't a supplication if I beg and I don't bind. If I plead, but I don't yield myself. Lord, give me this, give me that, do this for me, do that for me, and I will go on my own way and do what I was doing before, and live as I was living before. That's not good enough. There's an obligation in prayer. Of course, you can't give anything worthwhile to God, but you can yield yourself and your obedience to him. And that's all in the word supplication. So plead. It's not a light request you're bringing to God. It's something you very dearly need. It's not a mere possibility so you plead. God doesn't listen to light prayers, only supplications, pleading prayers. Or acknowledge always his superior will. And I'm going to say something about this in just a moment or two. So plead your unworthiness, plead your case, and bring your situation, which is worrying you, before the Lord. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, calling upon him, locating him, and then pleading with thanksgiving. Do you remember that part? With thanksgiving. With gratitude. As one who's full of gratitude to God. Not only for the prayers recently answered, but for everything. You know, I think people who are not grateful in ordinary life probably are not very grateful to God either in prayer. There's a principle that runs through scripture and it's expressed in all kinds of different ways. He that is faithful in little, for example, says the Lord, is faithful also in much. And that principle uh, is echoed here. If you're the kind of person, and this can happen to us when we're young, particularly, who never thanks anybody, unless you really have to, 
or unless it's something massive. You're not in that way, you're not in that habit. You're not a very grateful person. You don't thank people very much. You know, you probably won't thank God either. You'll come to him in prayer, you'll do the asking, oh yes. You'll ask for things, but you won't thank him very much. You never thanked him, really, for the privilege of life. You don't thank him enough. Well, you used to, but you don't anymore for salvation. You don't thank him at all for constant answers and deliverances and blessings and benefits. You take it all for granted. You don't help yourself if you're not grateful in ordinary life. So it's not my purpose to be speaking about this this evening, but if you identify yourself as somebody who doesn't thank people very much, check out whether you're thanking the Lord even, because I think it follows and it goes together. But gratitude, well, where do you start with gratitude? Somebody once said to me, if I were to try to pray for half an hour, what would I pray about? I thought, oh, what would you pray about? There is so much to pray about. When you think of all the departments of prayer in the scripture, we've already mentioned some of them. Adoration, you've got to spend time affirming before the Lord his greatness and his goodness and his attributes and his kindness and his mercy. You've got to thank him for the plan of salvation and the salvation of billions down the centuries. You've got to thank him for your own salvation. And remember, even if you're old like me, remember your testimony and give thanks to God for it. Often keep it alive in your heart and in your mind. And when you've finished all the thanksgiving for those things, you've got to thank him for recent answers to prayer unless you haven't had any because you haven't prayed, and that's very sad. Then, in addition to thanksgiving, you've got to go on and uh, intercede for others. And of course you've got to repent of your sin. When are you going to do that? And you've got to dedicate your life to him. And you've got to pray for the work of the gospel. And you, there's so many things to pray for. And you think, I haven't got... Put these headings, these great headings for prayer on a sheet of paper in the back of your Bible and uh, you'll never have enough time. Everybody should pray for at least, at least 15 minutes every day. Sometimes I shock people when I say that. I say, how can you as a pastor tell people to pray for only 15 minutes? Well, I look at it a different way. Knowing how easily people fail, I'm just saying, at least 15 minutes. You must pray for at least 15 minutes. That's separate from reading the word. But there's so much to pray for, and I'm talking about, or supposed to be talking about, gratitude here. Always pray to God and praise him and thank him for everything. Temporal blessings, earthly blessings, spiritual blessings in particular. Look at the text, dear friends. Be careful for nothing. I won't be long, because I realize I've got a good number of people here speak, thinking tonight in a second language, and that's quite wearing, so I won't be long. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests, another word for askings, be made known unto God. Throughout the day, whenever you ta undertake a journey, commit it to the Lord sincerely, that you'll be safe, that you'll be competent as a driver, whatever. Don't be self-sufficient and self-reliant in anything. Make everything known to the Lord. Remember the words of the Apostle James, ye have not because ye ask not. But I want to make some closing observations. Some Christians, you know this well, they want physical signs, like tongues speaking, or they want a tangible sense of God's nearness to them. They don't want to walk by faith. They want a tangible sense. 
but you know to have assurance in your heart and a great river of evidence flooding through your life in answered prayer, there's nothing to match that or to be compared with that. And there's an old saying, you, I think you must have heard this, it's not bad, but it's not good, really. It's not enough. And people will say, ah, when you pray, God has three ways of answering. Yes, no, or wait. Have you heard that? Yes, no, or wait. But you know, it's not much good. It obscures too much. It really is quite superficial. It isn't a terribly wise statement to make. And I'll tell you why. Well, for one thing, God never says no. Now, that's surprising, isn't it? And it needs just a word or two of explanation. But God never says no. But if a prayer doesn't seem to be answered, it isn't God saying no. It may be due to a number of things. It's, it's quite possible you're not asking properly. It's not, oh, I, I understand, God's just saying no. That's obscuring the possible reality that I need to know about, that I am not asking properly. That's a very likely problem. I'm not asking earnestly. That matters in prayer. I'm not asking sincerely because I've got sins in the cupboard, as I mentioned earlier, unconfessed, or I'm inconsistent in my spiritual life. God isn't saying no, he's just not listening to me, because I'm not really praying, if I'm praying insincerely. Maybe I'm not praying trustingly. My prayer is just, as we say, a long shot, a possibility. I don't believe, really. I'm not trusting him, that he has... I don't have to trust that he will do what I ask, but I have to trust that he can do anything that he chooses to do, that he has all the power. You've heard the term, the prayer of faith, and some people define that as somehow forcing yourself to believe that God will do what I ask. That's not the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is to believe that God can do anything that he chooses. What I'm asking may not be the way he chooses to answer the prayer. So yes, no, and wait is too simple. Am I asking correctly? Am I asking amiss to consume it upon my lusts, as James says? Am I asking for something just for me? Something fleshly? Something to make me look special? Or to give me comfort and ease and pleasure? Is it just for me? Am I asking amiss? And sometimes God is delaying any answer to prayer because he's calling us to pray more often, more persistently. That's something we see in scripture. You see it right in the very next book of the Bible. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, you have a hint of it. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Well, it's not quite the sense, but it's sometimes God is calling us to pray for someone or for something over quite a period of time. The Apostle Paul, in a very great illness, prayed in a we take it an unusually special way, three times, three seasons, I believe, of prayer for one thing. That it was not the will of God to bless him in that way. So, yes, no, and wait isn't enough. Prayer is always answered, yes. And I'll put it slightly differently and then we close. Yes, just as you asked or prayed. That's one possibility. Yes, but over time, you keep praying. You keep praying. You may pray for somebody as for years 
or some situation. John Newton, whose hymn we sung earlier, prayed for access to the ministry of the word for nine years. I'm sure it's true to say that Moses prayed that he would be instrumental in bringing about the deliverance of the children of Israel when he was in the land of Midian for 40 years. So sometimes God is saying yes over time, more to pray for. And sometimes he's saying yes, but much more wisely than you asked. My answer will be much wiser than what you asked for. You may not be delivered, you may be given strength to go through with something. All the promises of God in him are yea, and in him are men. Unto the glory of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. His answer, in a sense, is always yes. But sometimes, as he said to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, and that's the very best. Sometimes people have a great need, a great desire, a great and legitimate desire for something in their lives. Well, the very best thing to have is the grace of God and to have his, his answer. Maybe not what you're asking for, but the thing that he chooses for you and is preparing for you. So these are just some thoughts. Be careful, anxious for nothing at all other than obligations and duties, spiritual duties and sanctification. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, without exception, by prayer, coming truly into touch with the Lord, and supplication, asking, pleading, with thanksgiving and praise, let your requests, your askings, be made known unto God. And there's no blessing at all without asking. And I hope those simple observations as a refresher in prayer in just one evening will be of help to us all.